Hello and welcome to the Science of Psychotherapy and to this little shortcut, which is answering your questions about our book, The Practitioner's Guide to the Science of Psychotherapy. Hi, Richard. Hey, Matt. It's great. It's great to see you. Know, this, this, is, this is actually really fun for us yes. because, because we're, we're getting questions in uh, mm -hmm. all the time about the book and about, you know, talk a bit more about this. Can you just clarify a little bit? Uh, yep. And what we had was a question about the, the neural networks. Uh, That's right. so can, you, can you just flesh that out? So this area of neural networks. So what we need to start with is just uh, a, re a refresh of what we've got in the book. So I'm going to throw yes. that to you. I'll join in. But can, oh. let's refresh these, these three principal networks that have been talked about for quite some time that we've got uh, in the book. Absolutely. So as you said, there are three distinct networks. Well, I don't know about how distinct, but we, we, we'll sort of clarify what these, yeah, there's, they've there's been, overlap. Yeah, they've been talked about distinctly. I think They, they, they have, they have. So the intrinsic connectivity networks. And so we, we have the salience network, the central executive network and the default network. So let's just jump in, Richard. Um, what, let's start with the salience network. What is okay. that about? Yeah, well, see, the salience network is, uh, the word describes it. It's concerning the nature of uh, what is relevant, what's important. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a few areas that this relates to. This relates to uh, autobiographical memory. So those things that build up relevance uh, through your life experience that have some kind of uh, conscious reflective capacity. But also you have the implicit salience network, which really comes from limbic areas and uh, areas mm -hmm. like the amygdala, where you have those things that represent danger and those things that need to be, uh, that represent threats and concerns. So salience is that self-referential self-relevance uh, mm -hmm. that emerges. And so you need certain areas of the, uh, we find that there are certain areas of the brain that light up. So uh, what was what's the sort of the groupings as we understand them at the moment, or certainly as we present them in the book? Okay, let me just throw up a graphic here of the brain. Now, the main areas that we're looking at are the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, the rostral anterior cingulate cortex, the subgenial anterior cingulate cortex. So basically that whole area of the anterior cingulate cortex that we can see there, the thalamus, the amygdala, the basal ganglia, and the insula. Yeah, so really interesting that insula, particularly, which is talking, of, which insula, which looks at the internal representations and the, that internal sense of self, as different from the parietal, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. But there's that sensorial, that implicit sense of self. Exactly. So that interoception. So um, you know, we, we we know what's going on inside of us, combined with information that's coming from the outside. And I like to think of it as um, sort of the the social emotional um, salience of of what's happening on the inside and on the outside. Um, and we make sense of that um, both bottom up and and top down. So um, I, I, I give a little bit of an example uh, where as a, as a composer, you know, I might be moved by something that has happened. I have an emotional response. I have a gut response to it. And that is my salience network um, at work. Um, but we'll talk about the other networks that need to be involved for me as a composer then to create some music about and that. And you create music. But of course, the, the, the main point is that you might be listening to that piece of music and get all those in, incredible reactions. And I might be listening to it and not get those at all. So there's a self-relevance to, the, to the, yeah. the, the salience network pulls out. Okay, so the central executive network. Richard, what, what is that about? Well, this central executive network is mainly trying to describe what is happening, what parts of the brain are working when we're doing self-directed, consciously self-directed actions. Now, we certainly have, um, uh, and it varies in the terms that we use, certainly in the work with Ernest Rossi, we call them idiomotor responses, where there's just a, an automatic uh, type of action or movement or behavior. But the, the central executive network is more trying to describe the network that is making conscious decisions, conscious interruptions. Uh, and this involves, uh, interestingly, a part of the front of the brain and going back more into the to the rear parts of the brain. That's right. This... So fill us in on those uh, those 
the bits. You're the, you're the bits guy today, uh, Matt. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's let's have a look at our brain here again. So the main areas are the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the posterior parietal cortex. And it's interesting that we uh, now we've put that down. Now remembering that all this stuff, everything in neuroscience is a flux. So what we're talking about here, the dorsolateral, which is one that the area that seems to be most active when we're consciously um, we're consciously interrupting, uh, making decisions, going hello, what's what's that all about? The parietal has got a lot of um, energy and activity in relation when we're looking at the eye, the 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 me, not so much the interoceptive, but the um, the observably aware a sense of I that we have, you know, who I am. And certainly there's lots of discussion with uh, the, the executive network, the other, the orbito uh, frontal, which is looking for errors, the um, ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, which is looking more from the emotional type of aspect, whereas uh, the dorsolateral is more, is more co cognitive or rational in the, um, in the space. So there's a lot going on, but it is this relation with this regulating area, self-aware regulating area of the prefrontal cortex and the frontal cortex and the parietal cortex, which has a self-awareness of the eye. Now, and of course, this part of this this network, when it's activated, it's activated um, consciously with uh, you know focused attention. Uh, we we consciously bring it into activity as we are focusing on a particular task. Now, the last network is quite the opposite. It's uh, when we are not really paying too much attention. Richard, tell us about the default mode. Yes. Now, the default mode network is really interesting uh, because the default mode network, uh, uh, there are a lot of people who argue about this term default mode uh, network, but not to worry. It's the one that's used. So we'll work with that at the moment. But it's kind of like where the brain goes when it's not doing uh, stuff that we know we're doing. So in other words, when it's not self-directed, we go into this activity but sometimes we drift off into this activity when the executive network or the self-directed network tires or loses some um, loses uh, salience. And so this is very often the area of imagination. It's also the area of, of empathy, of, um, of intuition, of too intuitive sense of uh, what is going on. One might almost say our uh, emotional intelligence uh, might be more uh, around this default mode network than it is uh, around the executive network, which is tending to be a little bit more pragmatic. But then the salience network is terribly important in determining what it is that we should be feeling about something, whether it's a safety or a concern and so on and so forth. Yeah. But the default mode network, what, what, are, what are the, the, the parts that um, the areas of the brain that we're talking about with that one, Matt? Okay, let's throw our brain up again. And uh, so some of the, the areas involved are the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the subgenial anterior cingulate cortex, and the posterior cingulate cortex and the hippocampus. And what's interesting is there, we see that the same, there's a, there's a few areas of the brain that you said before. So mm -hmm. yes, folks, the brain doesn't just use one bit for one thing. <laughs> it's talking about the way in which the brain utilizes different areas of, um, uh, of neural uh, groupings and neural uh, frameworks and neural architecture in order to produce a response. Yeah. So this is why we come to the final starts of the conclusions of saying, no, these aren't separate networks, but these are areas, uh, networks that we could differentiate because of what they do. That's right. And uh, there's a flexibility that we should have where we sort of dance between the activity of all, of all of these networks. I mean, they're they're all sort of on all the time to some degree, but we, there's an emphasis at certain moments, and and we can ver we very we do very quickly jump from one mode being emphasized to another depending on what we're doing. And one of the things we bring out in the book is that there can be a bias where we can be sort of more biased towards maybe the default mode or more biased 
toward the salience network. And one of the things that a therapist can be aware of is, first of all, we'll be aware of that there are these, these networks and that there is a bias. And what you can do to help your client maybe be a bit more engaged in some of the networks that are not so engaged. So if someone that is, you know, always a daydreamer uh, is, is often in their default mode, or maybe some focused attention, you know, um, activities um, and maybe some activities to enhance their salience network, some, you know, some compassion, um, self-awareness, the, these sort of things that can help. And of course, exactly the same. Let's just flip the other one. Those who get too much focused on on self directing everything and controlling everything just need to go off and do some <laughs> uh, some mindfulness, some imagination, some art therapy. Some yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so this uh, and it's interesting because we've we've had a couple of really good friends of ours who have made some great commentaries. Um, yeah. uh, John Arden has made this commentary of. It's the interplay between these three networks that determines the nature of consciousness. Um, now, I don't want to talk too much, uh, uh, you know, of John's work, but certainly that's one of the impressions that I've got from it. So, you know, mm. you know I stand corrected if needs be. Um, so please go and have a look at Mind, Brain, Gene. You know, John talks about it really well there. So that nature, and so when we say, so they don't necessarily operate separately, mm. but there's like a Venn diagram, you know, one uh, rises yes. and one's fall. And then another uh, really interesting comment uh, in recent work, the last few years, is Lou Cozzolino, mm -hmm. of course. And he's actually bringing all the networks together. Uh, he's calling them the, the amygdala, the safety network, the frontal parietal, uh, network and the default mode network, calling them all the executive network. Right. Uh, and it's deficits in one or the other, which is what you were just talking about, where mm. you have a bias mm. one way or the other. Yeah. But I think uh, when you when you look at uh, what uh, Lou is talking about with the amygdala based network, that's that's taking in what we're talking about with the salience network and what John Arden talks about there. And that frontal parietal, well, that's the, uh, the, the the executive network. So Lou is trying to water down the the barriers between our thinking in these networks and give it a more yeah. broad aspect of, of what to deal with, which is also what you just said, Matt, saying if they're not emotional enough, then we need to do those. If they're too rational, we need to do this. If they're not imaginative enough, we need to do those sorts of things. And we can use this understanding of the three contexts of these internal next works to also see uh, to, to see what we need to add into their experience. I think you covered it really well. Fantastic. And our understanding is continuing to evolve, to develop. I mean, this is where our understanding stands right now. I mean, we used to just talk about the triune brain model. And I think we have a, a much more sophisticated and more helpful model now talking about these networks. But no doubt, we're going to continue to discover more and more and continue to have a more sophisticated and clearer understanding of how our brain works. And uh, this is just one of the exciting things about what we're doing here at the Science of Psychotherapy. And most importantly, giving you a, a deeper insight, a, a, a elements, just, just maybe that small thing, which, which gives you a sense of confidence about the therapeutic approach you're using, or it gives you a sense of insight into what's missing from your therapeutic approach. Uh, and uh, I think there's been quite a few pointers in uh, this last few minutes of, of, of our talking that uh, are beyond the, the, some technical, but I think also some very good, interesting uh, insights and suggestions for what you can bring into the therapy room because this knowledge has enhanced your depth. Well, thank you for tuning in to the Science of Psychotherapy. Please keep those questions coming in and we'll catch you next time. Bye for now.